And with that, let's get our uh, next uh, panel discussion started as well. We've got uh, three of our speakers joining in and uh, another very interesting panel discussion on understanding what builds a retail brand, uh, brand versus retail, that's what we're talking about. So first up, I'm going to invite our moderator, session moderator on stage. We have the CEO of Domino's, Mr. Prateek Pota. If I may please invite Mr. Prateek on stage. And then we also have the CEO of Nature's Basket, Avni Davda. If I may please invite Avni Davda on stage. And the Chief Marketing Officer with Titan Watches, Suparna Mitra. We also have with us Mr. Sadashiv Nayak uh, of uh, Big Bazaar. So he's also going to be joining. He's the CEO of Big Bazaar, so he's going to be joining in as well. We're just going to quickly make the arrangement. Let's have a special round of applause there to invite our panel member, Mr. Sadashiv Nayak. And with that, I'm going to hand over the proceedings to our session moderator, Mr. Prateek Pota. Over to you, sir. Hi, good evening, everyone. Let me first start by apologizing for what's going to be a difficult session from a voice point of view. I've lost my voice yesterday, and I've been struggling my way through hot water goggles. Thank you, Vikram, for the recommendation. And this is where I've reached. So I'm going to inflict this voice upon you for the next 30 minutes. Apologies for that. Uh, if I may be allowed to start on a slightly personal note, um, I was introduced uh, as somebody from Domino's, but uh, it would be fair to say that for the large part of my career, I've been an FMCG person. Uh, so when Sam came to me some time back and said I should uh, take a session on uh, building a retail brand, I thought about my last one year at Domino's, and I thought it would be a good time to step back and reflect uh, on how the journey has been and how, how the last one year has been different from the preceding 24. Uh, and what made the invitation even more uh, attractive and compelling was the fact that I was going to be talking to and conversing with an eminent panel uh, that I'm very, very privileged to be a part of. Um, these are all towering leaders, thought leaders in the industry, and some of whom I can also count as friends. Uh, so if I can start off um, the session, um, go around the table, and if I may ask, um, all of you are part of very, very strong retail brands. Um, Nature's Basket, Big Bazaar, Titan, Tanishq. Um, how, how has been your own journey of building your retail brand? Uh, what have been the challenges that you've been dealing with? Uh, how have you sort of grappled with those challenges, wrestling them down to the ground? And how have those challenges, uh, if you will, sort of help you uh, draw some conceptual learnings about what it takes to build a retail brand? Let me start with you, Avni. Thank you, Prateek. And uh, it's uh, great to be here. I think the sessions have been quite enlightening and informative. A reference to your question, I think, about reflecting on how brands are built in retail specifically and how are they different from a product journey. I think I've had uh, some experience both in my stint at Starbucks, before that with Taj, and now with Nature's Basket. I think in retail, uh, Pratik, one of the fundamental learnings has been is that it's, it's not just a particular attribute or value that you can associate with a product. I think it is an entire environment or an experience that the customer leaves with. While the transaction is really about the sale of a product or a service, I think there's a lot of different things that go into building a retail brand. Uh, in my last uh, almost two years at Nature's Basket, I think we've tried to build a journey. It's a very loved and iconic brand, uh, almost considered to be very premium in the grocery space. But if some of you have noticed over the last uh, eight to nine months, we've really changed the way the brand looks, we're in the midst of a transformation. And we've really tried to shift away from being a premium, overly aspirational, expensive brand to a more daily food delight and a more neighborhood kind of a brand that we're trying to build. And I think some of the learnings that I can share is that in retail, uh, A, it is, uh, you know, when you, when you start working through the industry, it is about a lot of detail in every aspect of the environment. It's a lot of detail in the communication that you want to get through. So while you have a product and you have you know, a certain set of values and attributes when you're dealing in FMCG, in retail you have to walk through the entire customer journey, whether it's online or offline, but there are several touch points. So a discipline is very important. 
a very narrow focus on what you want to get communicated. You cannot afford to defocus on it. By defocus, I mean that you cannot expect, a, whether it's online or offline, any person or any customer to engage with more than two messages maximum at a point, right? Whether it's a person selling something to you across the counter or you're on a web page, I think the two is a good number to stick with. So discipline in terms of messaging is very important. And one other learning is that when we talk to consumers in India or around the world, I think uh, a few years back when I was working in Starbucks, it was always that talking about price is very sensitive. People generally don't want to approach the subject, and more so when brands are pivoting from being premium to mass premium or aspirational. Uh, in my limited journey, I believe that the Indian consumer or any consumer, irrespective of the market that you operate in, price has become a very, very important conversation. The value that consumers are placing on that part of the conversation shouldn't be taken lightly. So just discipline, two messages, uh, different touch points for a retail brand, and price is definitely at the center of the conversation. So thank you, Avni. It's interesting that you talk about price right off the bat. And we'll come back to that a little later. Uh, but if I may turn to Saparna, uh, your experience. Um, so for uh, me, the way, uh, the difference I really see uh, between building a product brand and building a retail brand is uh, the number of people who are in control of the product brand, so the product managers who are deciding the merchandise, uh, the product mix, pricing, advertising, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, very, it's a small group of relatively you know, in, in intellectual people and you can guide them and they will you know, be able to get the brand. The challenge in retail, and I'll talk about uh, the brand the World of Titan, which is the store chain, uh, 480 stores in 210 towns, and uh, most of which are franchisee owned and franchisee managed. And their employees, who are the people who are finally interacting with the consumers, and uh, you know, at best they get paid you know, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 rupees a month. Uh, they've not uh, you know, been to business schools. They don't understand a lot of concepts, but they are the ones who are dealing with the consumers. And for them to get what your brand is about, what your product is about, for them to display the product day in and day out right, to be able to communicate right, uh, your brand uh, you know, can get scattered, and it very often does. Uh, and, you know, we, we say that what we plan, you know, in, in the original pristine form of, uh, say, a product or a campaign launch, if it is 100, by the time you go to uh, town number 210, it's probably a 35 to 40. And there is, you know, a lot of loss. So that's very tough. It's very operationally intense. It needs uh, training, retraining, just a lot of execution. And that's, I think, the very big difference that I see. Thank you, Subhana. And uh, I guess the challenge would be no different for Big Basket. Exactly. Big, I'm sorry, my apologies. Is the shadow, halo effect of Big Basket. <laughs> my apologies. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, we see it as a large opportunity. And uh, I, I think um, if you really look at, uh, I mean, I, I would put retail as uh, the equivalent to the chachi or the mommy who would come home. I think she would she would have traveled all the states of Jaipur and Rajasthan and Gujarat, and she would always be seen as I mean I'm narrating personal experiences where you'd kind of see her as a well-traveled person or a well-traveled man, but when she came home she would kind of sit down with you, have the food with you, hath se khati thi, laddu lati thi, thode bhot slangs bolti thi. So I think I think we see retail as that brand which is very very local to that catchment. So we see that as an opportunity. Um, for lack of time, we will not talk about it, but for us, the largest brand manager for us is the store karta. We call the manager the store karta, who really executes the brand at that place. Big bazaar may mean many things to all of us, but what it means in Agartala stays in Agartala. What it means in Virar stays in Virar. So that's really the first messaging to say that it is that person who's traveled worldwide or traveled the country, is a leader. But when it comes down to the local catchment, she gossips with you, he gossips with you, she kind of enjoys all the uh, local nuances of that particular catchment. I think for us, therefore, it has meant three things. One, 
Um, and Shiv Kumar really bashed up the MBAs in the earlier session. Uh, I, I think we, I had to kind of, we had to kind of come out of this whole term called segmentation. Maybe it's more particular to brands like Big Bazaar, which is really uh, straddling across categories. But we kind of really talk about the concept of unsegmenting. There's no segmentation within us. We are welcoming everyone. You'll have the, uh, in certain occasions, we'll have the India too. People from the slums will come. And then suddenly you'll have a very different audience who comes into some of our mall stores. So unsegmenting is one lesson for us. I think right now we're on a journey where we're trying to personalize at a large scale. Um, the scale of Big Bazaar, we're trying to personalize enough data on hand, enough big data, all the cliches are there with us. But how do we personalize? And it, personalization could mean, if you look at, we're in the business of apparel, um, what is the shirt size which is required in Northeast is not very different from the shirt size which is required in Rajasthan. And so how do you kind of factor that in that personalization? And when it comes to food, I'm sure Avni would know that, you know, the, um, literally across 50 kilometers, you may have a very different rice being consumed in a state called Tamil Nadu or Kerala. So how do you personalize that? And that's uh, personalizing to scale the second messaging. Third, what we're really gearing up for, and I think it's a journey which personally gives me a lot of, um, what should I say, positive jitters, is we're trying to include as many people as we come. We've created a day within the brand of Big Bazaar for senior citizens. We don't call them senior citizens anymore, we call them young elders. So there's a whole track being run to get young elders into our stores. And as we speak, we're get gearing up to be ready for people with disabilities to shop with us. So for us, the brand, how does it expand more and more and get many more customers in without really having the word segmentation, as I told right at the beginning, is very important. The underlying theme, of course, is uh, for many of our categories, we are actually the brand owners. I mean, um, you may ha we have brands, strong brands for watches, we have strong brands for soaps and detergents. But who will sell more backpacks in the country? Who will sell more four-burner gas stoves in the country? There aren't too many brands. So Big Bazaar becomes a brand which says, we will create our own labels, we'll create a brand. Who will sell more flowers in the country? I mean, there's a lot of fasting and feasting which happens in the country, but they aren't enough kuttu atta. So who will sell those flowers? So really, Big Bazaar becomes a brand which becomes a brand owner for many of these products and categories. So that's been a journey, very, very localized. And we see it as a huge opportunity rather than a challenge. We found our own ways of kind of managing the brand there. No, thank you. Uh, if, I may, if I may just sort of uh, pose a, a counter question to that. Very interesting. Um, but, and at the risk of being a little provocative, if I may ask, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't the, a brand like that run the risk of trying to be all things to all people, to be inclusive to the extent that it uh, fragments its messaging? That's the first part of my question. And the other one would be, how do you ensure that the experience that a, a shopper gets in Agartala is the same that he or she would get in some other part of the country? And is that really important in the first place? Or would a, would a, could a brand or retail brand be okay with you know, people feeling different parts of the animal differently? I, I think we're quite okay. Uh, we, we, I mean, I, I won't call it tolerance, but uh, we've designed such that the local nuances overpower any amount of standardization. So I'll answer your second question first. So if you think about a store like Guwahati, which is a store for us and a very profitable and large store in uh, Guwahati, um, there is, we run during the local festival there a ticket size offer which will give you a fish to pick up when you achieve so much rupees in Big Bazaar. Now, that kind of a tactical activation, we'll never be able to think of it sitting in Mumbai, never. But m mind you, the brand becomes very, very strong during that month. We have tons and tons of people coming and shopping for that fish there. The first one, I think uh, really about uh, saying, are we at risk? Uh, frankly, uh, as I told you, there, there's always, when we kind of um, look at a decentralized operation, there'll always be that little bit of tolerance which one will have to bear. But category after category, when we go back and see what we've done, I think the merits of having a store which is a brand, which is alive in that catchment, overpass everything else. I mean, overpass everything else, be it celebrating um, Pongal somewhere, be it celebrating a Women's Day somewhere, everything which is relevant to that particular catchment, the benefits we get are overpowering. Uh, maybe a very specific thing about Big Bazaar is we actually define our category structure as Roti Kapada Makan. We are present in all three categories. Unlike many of the other uh, formats which we have studied, I think the mix from each one of them is very large. Uh, I believe we are one of the, we are surely the largest volume producers in apparel as Big Bazaar, in apparel. And food, of course, we are there. 
So if you look at uh, the Roti Kapra Makan approach, I think we, we kind of naturally inclined to say, get, let's get many more, many more cust customers. We can't really be focusing on one particular segment or we can't focus on one particular age group. Everyone's welcome. Uh, I think what remains constant uh, to your point, Pratik, is really a lot of values. I think uh, be it about democratizing consumption. I mean, there's a, only the only conversation when a new product comes and saying, "Hum log do lakh piece kaise bechenge," I and mean, that's the conversation. So whether it is price as a lever, whether it is uh, a co combination as a lever, whether it is using our uh, big data as a lever, that's the conversation which happens. I think the democratizing has been a large value. Saying so anything which comes, we have to make sure that five lakhs, ten lakhs, six lakhs people buy in the country, and, and so that's been a fairly constant uh, theme for us. No, that, that makes a lot of sense, and I must uh, sort of, you know, g give you credit because uh, as a shopper, if I go to a big bazaar store in Phoenix Mills here or in Sahara Mall in Gurgaon, I see no difference. Uh, I, I experience the brand as one. So clearly, you sort of uh, defining it as Roti Kapra Makan seems to have transcended the possible uh, divisions. Uh, from my own point of view, you know, um, going back to what we were discussing about FMCG versus retail brands, I think the one huge difference is that as an FMCG marketeer, uh, how I perceive the brand uh, is dependent on how I am communicated. So the communication piece is a big driver of perception. And brands are built largely by communication. And you know, this is the right forum for talking about that. But I, would, I dare say uh, how I experience the brand is how retail brands are more predominantly built. And going back to uh, Suparna's point about therefore ensuring that uh, the experience uh, in whichever part of the country is, is uniform, I think that becomes as much a brand building challenge as it becomes a customer service challenge. So uh, in your experience, Avni, how, how, do you, how do you ensure that that moment of truth, when the shopper walks in, the premium shopper in your case, looking for a very specific assortment, a specific product, and looking for more information, that person in that store is able to d disseminate that information accurately, credibly, succinctly. Uh, I think the difference really for anyone working for a product company, and I think uh, she kind of uh, so, you know, reflected on it a while back, is that you have a defined set of people, and then you put it out there through your distribution or through media, and you talk about ROI and stuff like that, right? It's very tangible, it's uh, maybe measurable, there's a lot of debate on that. But when you move to an experience like in a nature's basket, which is a grocery experience or a big bazaar, uh, I think the touch points are more diluted. And when I say diluted, I don't mean that the message cannot be uh, you know, given in a focused manner. What I mean is there's a lot of human factor that comes in. Uh, it's almost like an analogy of working in an army, right? So there is a set of people that decide how the war will be fought, and then everyone has to fall in line to do it. But unfortunately, uh, unlike a war in a retail environment, there are a lot of human factors that come to play. So the training of the people, or largely where you get the people from, and what they understand of your brand becomes very, very important. So in the moment of truth, whether you're looking for a refined cheese, or you're looking for that particular wine, or simply buying an atar or a chawal, it is either that POS material that you have, or the person behind the counter who influences that transaction. And a lot, a lot of miles have to be walked for that person, really, to translate an experience. Uh, in my previous company, I think Starbucks, it, it, uh, we used to very humbly say that the company is very, very fragile, while it's a very large retailer. In retail, most uh, large companies will admit that where there is a human influence, the company is very fragile. Because if the person is not having a good day, or how much of a training he or she may have received, the moment of truth does get messed up, right? Whether it's a beverage they are making, or the cheese that they are selling to you, or you know the, the particular promotion. Like in Big Bazaar, if he runs something and the fish runs out, that's the end of the promotion, right? You may have a thousand customers waiting, but they will not have a great experience. So I think for retailers, uh, one is we have to be very humble in accepting that focus is required so that rather than giving out 100% and the 210th store having 35%, your entire journey and your, the entire time that you spend is to ensure 99% is delivered at every store. Is it tough? Yes, it is. I think it's very, very challenging. And today, the environment, Pratik, is also very different, right? Look at Amazon Go, or we had our, you know, a colleague from Big Basket talking about how she could track every minute of what is happening at online screen. 
So for me, uh, the time is great. I think it's the age of the consumer. Uh, they literally are not just the king, but they, they are very promiscuous. They are in a space where they, are, they have the luxury of choice. And as marketeers or business people or as growth managers, I think our challenge is A, to maintain that discipline, to have the humility to understand that the job of communicating uh, in a product company or in a retail company is going to be challenging. And I think we should, uh, by and large, try and love it because it is going to continue to get even more complex, right? I was watching, uh, you know, talking to a friend who actually went to the Amazon Go store at Seattle. And, uh, you know, he actually tried to flick something just to know what are those little gizmos and cameras. He took something and put it in his colleague's bag and just to see who has to pay for it. And he got charged for it, right? So Amazon Go is almost a humanless store with almost 134 cameras is what I read about. So technology is also another big challenge that uh, we should look at as an opportunity and embrace very quickly. So that's my two bit about where uh, you know, brand messaging or the moment of truth comes. I think it, it's, it's an exciting time and the, the faster we embrace it rather than looking at it as a big question to answer and enjoy the journey, I think it'll be more fruitful. Thank you. I'm going to make a mental note of that. The consumer is a promiscuous king. Okay, so if I can turn to you, Saparna, uh, are, are there any best practices that uh, you have, uh, I guess, over time uh, arrived at for ensuring that harmonization of the moment of truth? Um, anything that you've done at Titan? Um, so I'll give an example, which is a very successful example, and uh, I mean, I'm admitting that there have been many failures, and but I wouldn't, I'm not giving an example of a failure. The successful example that we had uh, very recently, we did in uh, Titan Raga, uh, a collaboration with Masaba Gupta, who's a designer. And it was, um, uh, it was we, we thought, very, a very good association because Raga is known for, it is the only women's watch brand in India. It's known for a very specific design language code. It has a very specific consumer base. Uh, however, we felt that uh, it needed a newer, younger audience, you know, base coming in. Uh, and, uh, you, and, and part of it is also the position of, of Raga because it is seen as a, a more ornate and a more feminine watch, which would be uh, worn on special occasions. And uh, it goes really well with, well with Indian wear. And what is happening is a lot of young women don't wear Indian wear anymore. And uh, uh, we felt that Masaba was a designer who was really able to connect uh, and give a real fresh twist to Indian wear. So that's how the association started. Now that's just at that concept level, then the product, which was something which is very unique, then the advertising, which was most, almost all on digital. The interesting thing was the retail presentation and uh, the VM that went with it, the, 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 the training that went with it, and the ability of the... Uh, uh, I, I would say a lot of, we call them customer relationship officers, CROs, the sales staff. A lot of the uh, younger women CROs did an outstanding job of explaining that unique uh, collection to consumers. I think they connected it uh, at a level beyond the, you know, the PPTs and the, the training. They were able to suggest to a lot of younger consumers, you know, why don't you look at this and this is how it works. and. Uh, and uh, we, we did fantastically well. It continues to sell and sell very well. I think we were surprised, and it sold in a lot of smaller towns also. So, uh, you know, I'm actually now contradicting what I was saying earlier, which is that uh, there are challenges, but sometimes you can be surprised with what uh, potential there is and how um, retail can be an, a huge enabler to a quirky idea and, you know, without the retail store and the retail chain, I don't think uh, this would have found its place under the spotlight. It really found a stage and we really were able to explain it. And, and the rest of it was, of course, the consumer was ready for it. Thank you. Uh, does it also happen, and this is a question for everyone, uh, could it also happen that the limitations in store of the CRO, for instance, become a bottleneck in, uh, or become a boundary condition for the brand? But it can't explore the extremities because there is a bottleneck at the store. Has it ever happened to any of you? Not really. Um, I, I think, as I said, we, we still maintain that, uh, that the people there really has been the 
bi binding force to build brands. I, I think what's really been um, holding us back are more efficiency related stuff. And I think this is not the forum to discuss that. We can bring that out. But uh, for us, they have been the custodians uh, to really build a brand. I think uh, uh, what we do, if I have to just share some rituals which we do, I, I think it could be very small things like there are storytelling sessions within the store where we are not involved. They talk about what, what they did yesterday for customers. I think it's a very small story. It's a sit-down story. They normally talk about what we did yesterday for a customer. I think that's a storytelling session which happens. Two, let's say um, many of our stores on their own do a ritual of clapping the first few customers when they enter the store. From our end, there are certain rituals which we also do, and I would like to share an experience. We went to a store in Matunga, not possibly the best experience of store. It was a store which we kind of acquired from another chain. Um, we built, as I said, we're gearing up for uh, being ready for people with disability. So we created a trial room for apparel, and we created a, a toilet for, a, for people with disability. And when we walked in there, the store manager came and said, Sir, there's a lot of shortage. Hai. We trial room, but we have one person in four months. And for us, so we could have said, okay, let's do something. But we said, okay, one let's be ready for that. And till then, till they don't come, you can use it for whatever else you want. But whenever that person, he or she comes to buy apparel, a person with disability, we should be ready for it. So those are the messaging and I think small, small rituals and small, small messaging which we do symbolically. But I think which really says that the customer is so centric to the brand, we can't run it out of um, a home office in uh, Mumbai. So you'll have to run it at your place. We can only create the infrastructure for you. So for us, it's never been a challenge from that space. Well, that's an amazing story. Um, if I may switch gears a little bit and go back to Avni, what you began uh, in your opening remarks, you spoke about price. Now, classical marketing, um, and in the school that I grew up in, it seemed to me that uh, uh, and Shiv talked about it in his uh, speech as well. Um, excessive discounting, sustained deep discounting hurts and damages brand equity. But it seems to me now that the, almost the entire retail industry has been built on a succession of uh, deep discounts. So uh, how, how do we reconcile this apparent paradox? Any, any, any response? I think... Uh one pratik is that when I when I spoke about price, I think uh, irrespective of we can we can debate about how uh, a lot of different business models in e-tailing and others are getting built, and therefore both online and offline are forced to have these discount battles. Or so you look at even telecommunications, a very different kind of price war is being you know raged in that sector as well. What I meant by price is that uh, today consumers are a promiscuous and they are so spoiled for choice that you need to very appropriately understand what value you're creating for them. And whether you're premium, whether you're selling a $50,000 watch or you're selling a $50 wine, I think you have to be very clear of what you stand for and be very open about, uh, you know, open and transparent about talking about it. So I don't think we have the luxury to say that we can launch at a price, let the season get over and we'll discount. Because today consumers, like the West, they wait, wait and wait for your discount before making the purchase choice, especially in discretionary uh, items. Uh, but when I, when I speak about price, I think we've always tried to walk away and every marketer or even a business leader is very afraid to take uh, the communication on price head on. And a little while back you said, how does a retail workforce at the store level become an impediment sometimes in the price conversation? So I'll give you an example of our brand. Uh, price, and you know, we never had any price tags. If you walked into a nature's basket uh, two years back, it was all about, uh, you know, a great brand, but everybody thought that the aspirational, the who's who bought their grocery from here, it was not a neighborhood store. So really, even the staff actually believed, and we had instances of customers telling us that I'm an average uh, middle class person, I walk into your store and I feel alienated. It's like it's not for me. So really moving away from that, and before we could take the price conversation or the transformation of the brand to the customer, we had to convince the people at the store of what we were doing. And believe me, it was challenging. So the best conversation were to be had within the store and tell them, this is what our prices are. And they would still not accept, especially in categories like F&V or bakery. They always assumed we are far more expensive than the local store or the nearest competitor. So A, when you start talking about the price, our journey has been to convince our own internal battles first before we take it to the consumer. 
And uh, sometimes it can become an impediment. And I think not only focus and discipline, but a lot of data is required to even convince people internally. Thank you. Uh, Subana, any thoughts on this? Yeah, you're right, Pratik. This, uh, you know, in the last, I would say, probably five or six years, uh, the amount of discounting, as well as the weeks on discounting, has, you know, really gone berserk. Uh, this is true, true for most apparel and accessory brands, and uh, um, and it is partly also because uh, apart from the usual end of season sale season that used to happen in July August, and there was a reason, you know, in apparel there's always a reason why you have end of season, and it's particularly true in Western countries where what you wear in summer is so different from what you wear in winter, so your fresh season merchandise arrives by March and you sell right from April to June and then in July you, you, you know, liquidate and by September you get in fall, uh, fall and winter. Somehow we are now following that and as a result what has happened is we have those four to six weeks. Now, what on top of this, what has come are the e-com uh, discount days, you know, the big billions and all of that. So as a result, all of the brands then uh, are following two or three rhythms of discounting. One was the original one, one is what, you know, the e-com players have actually, you know, almost led a lot of brands to do. Uh, because if you don't participate, you you know, you there's blood on the floor. And if you do participate, uh, well, there's blood somewhere else, I guess. So it, it, is, it is a tough choice. Uh, and the third thing, which is also something that I see increasingly, is retailers are doing occasion, you know, it is Valentine's Day, so I give discount. It is, uh, uh, no, uh, you know, uh, New Year's, so I give discount. It's Christmas, so I give discount. It is Friendship Day, so I give discount. So uh, it has gone a little, uh, you know, haywire. Uh, but brands are, are, of course, very, uh, very mindful that all of this leads to margin erosion. And, you know, there is always that tussle between growth, market share on one side and margin erosion on the other. And I think, you know, a lot of brands are now getting into a slightly more sane space because it's not sustainable. Well, thank you. And if I may just uh, end with an example from, from my own universe. Uh, Domino's used to do a very deep buy one get one discounting for a long time until last year. And uh, we were uh, mortally afraid of putting it back. Uh, but when we did that, we stopped deep discounting uh, and we moved to a more rational everyday price. Uh, we have seen our sales increase, our brand equity measures improve, and of course, margins come strongly back as well. So th thank you. Thank you, folks, for a very fascinating discussion and thank you for your time. If I may just summarize and, you know, four or five points that we've uh, discussed and placed before you. A, I think the first and the most important thing is that um, the consumer, uh, whether he or he's a promiscu promiscuous king or not, uh, has to be at the epicenter of whatever we do, understanding him, making sure that the service experience in the store through storytelling techniques, through any other training protocols, I think that remains super important. Technology can be a force multiplier. We didn't talk much about that today. But we all know that in retail and in omnichannel world, recognizing consumer using technology can be an extremely powerful asset. Um, brand building, therefore, in the retail universe has to be necessarily cross-functional. It has to involve supply chain. The stocks have to be there in the store. It has to involve a service, customer service team. It has to involve HR, happy employees, and, of course, marketing. So it would be fair to say, I guess, that brand building is as much a CEO's job as it is the CMO's. And in that, retail brands are no different from FMCG brands. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to request our panel members to please remain on the stage. I'd like to invite Mr. Vivek Sharma, the Chief Marketing Officer with Pedalite, to please come forward and present a token of gratitude to all of our speakers as well.
if we may request all of you to come together for a group photograph as well. Thank you once again.